When I was 23 years old, I was living in my parents' basement. I had no job and I had recently graduated. And I got an email from Kenya. It was my friend Michael. We were roommates in college and he sent me an email and it said, how much money do we have in our bank account? And I said, we have $250 in my bank account. <laughs> and he said, send it all. Because we're starting a school in Kenya. You may ask, how did we meet with Nate? It all starts in Kenya. When I got this exceptional sponsorship to come to U USA for school, I end up in Bethel College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And my first day, new students were given orientation. We were running through the college campus. Around noon, I was tired. Then trying to make sense of the new environment with everything div different, few people of color. I was lost in the crowd. I found myself standing still and staring around. As, as this was happening, a young white boy walked straight to me and stretched his hand and said, I'm Nathan. Then I said, hi, I'm Michael. Our friendship with a strike are not from there on. You can imagine what being in a new culture looks like. They call it a culture shock. Nathan helped me adjust and acclimatize to my new setup. He invited me to their house, met their family. But as things normally happen, towards the tail end of my college life, I had my time was up and I had to go back to Kenya. Didn't feel right, but it was imperative. I had had a great opportunity and a great time with a great friend. When I was over in Kenya, I had these grand plans and excitement of getting into the corporate world with this Bethel College diploma. I knew I had the best education and I had a place in Kenya for a good job. But before I could do that, I hit over to my village. I come from a nomadic tribe that depend pretty much on animals, cows, camel, goats, sheep. That is the environment I grew up in. And I was now going back to that setup. When I got there, things didn't look right. The cow is quite a blessing and a curse for nomad tribes, for they fight over them. I, I found out that there had been relentless fighting between my tribe and the neighboring tribes. Young people were, had been killed, women affected, and so were the kids had been orphaned in the process. The elders asked me, now that I had come back, to do something about the kids who had been orphaned. It was a tough, a tough situation because little did they know all I had was a college diploma from Bethel College. Never had a bank account to back up what they were asking. You see, Michael's community um, has been plunged into a state of conflict for generations. When the British came to Africa, they pushed the nomadic people of Kenya off their traditional lands, which is fertile and green. They pushed them out into the desert with too many people and not enough resources. On these reservations, Michael's tribe suffered under constant violence in a never-ending struggle for basic resources. With these children before me, I tried as much as possible to let myself free from this as assignment, as it were. But as I tried to do that, I realized I was in a huge moral dilemma. 
You see, 30 years ago, Michael had found himself in the same situation. When I was about nine years, my village and got into a huge problem. Water became scarce, so was pasture for the animals. And when that happened, the village has to literally migrate several miles further away where they can find water and pasture. Or maybe they can migrate also because of insecurity. But this time, the drought was unbearable and my village had to move. <coughs> when that happened, we ended up moving so close, in close proximity to the Tava tribe. As a kid, we were awoken one morning by a lot of shouting, gunshots, confusion. All we could do was to run for our dear life. And when that <coughs> happened, later in the afternoon, the whole village had been overrun. We lost the animal, young people had been killed. Kids like we were, we ended up fending for ourselves. I found myself in a band of hard boys. Of course, some were older enough to have been in charge of the process. But I recall one time we ran into a wide path, an unusual path, because we had never seen something like that. And, we would, and we, there were so many theories thrown here and there. Some older boys were like, maybe the elephants organized themselves and made this highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we didn't know. In, implying we had drifted further away from our natural setup. As we were trying to make sense of what we were seeing, we, we first heard some booming noise. In a short while, something showed up from the farthest end. We didn't know what to make of this, but it was a monster accompanied with the booming noise. We were seeing a truck for the first time. And when it showed up, everything took a whole new level. When the occupants got out, and we literally took off, we flee, fearing for our life. You know what? We were seeing white people for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it was so freaking and scary. <laughs> <laughs> and what we compared with, is our native fairy tales about the ogres. Ogres are extraterrestrial beings from planet Mars, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and we were here now face to face with them. It isn't a good experience meeting the ogres. So, but as things played out, we were able to come to the truck, and we realized they had noses, hair. Hey, these people look like us. But what happened to their their skin. Did somebody torture these people by plunging them in a boiling pot of hot water <laughs> or something? They don't look right. <laughs> so when that, ha when that happened, they handed us some candies. That would be our first time to test a candy, and it tasted great. Yeah. And from there, they gave us water, they gave us some food. That place, I don't know where they were, either to South Sudan or where, but that turned out to be a feeding camp and it became an elementary school and I would start my schooling life there. Michael became a sponsor child for a family in Oregon. And eventually he was able to procure a scholarship to come to America. And Michael and I became roommates in college. Now, as many of you can imagine, there was a super steep learning curve for being friends with someone who originally believed that white people were ogres. <laughs> I grew up in a sheltered sub suburb of Minneapolis and didn't have a ton of experience in cross-cultural relationships. But one of the things that Michael and I have learned in our relationship is that it's really important to learn the big and small stories 
Now, big and small stories are the stories that have shaped our lives. When I say big stories, I mean the things that we read in history books. Americans have World War II, the moon landing, the American dream. Kenyans have the story of traditional life. They have the story of British colonialism and eventually Kenyan independence. But we also have small stories. If big stories are the things we read in history books, small stories are the things we write in our journal. Our families, where we went to school. So while Michael's country has the story of colonialism, Michael himself had wonderful experiences with those first ogres. In cross-cultural friendships, it's really important to learn the big stories but not assume the small stories. Not everyone has interpreted their history in the same way. I'll give you a good example of how big and small stories can collide in cross-cultural friendships. One day, I was teaching Michael how to drive, and we were walking up to the vehicle, and Michael asked if he could drive our car. I was like, whoop, time out. This is not our car. This is my family's car, and I'm allowing you to drive it today while I'm also in it. And his face fell. And I could tell that something wasn't right. Because what I didn't know was that in Michael's community, they don't have private property. So you'll never hear someone say, this is my cow or my hut. It's always our car, our hut. Because in Michael's village in the desert, life is challenging and they pool their resources to survive. So Michael was coming from a traditional nomadic perspective of communal ownership, and I was coming from a suburban American perspective of private property. Now, if you've been a part of a cross-cultural friendship, you've had a moment like this, where your big and small stories collide. And in those moments, it's really important to take a deep breath and listen to what's happening. Listen to what's behind the language. Michael looked at me and said, this is our car because we are a community. And if we are going to get through life, we have to pool our resources. This was one of the first great lessons I learned in cross-cultural friendship. The second came when I visited Michael in his village. Yes, there I was with the elders and the kids and didn't know where to start from. But I knew the kids needed food and some care and some safe heaven. Then I relayed an email to Nathan, letting him know of what I was going through. Suffice to say, when Nathan and I were at college as roommates, we never planned to start a school in Kenya whatsoever. We just had a great time. We learned from each other. It helped me make sense of America. So like any other encounter of young people. So when I got back, and with these kids and the elders, I thought of him. I thought I wish Nathan was here. Maybe we can rally our troops and see what to do with the kids. So it didn't take long for Nathan to show up. When he, when he did, I was really excited, and I showed him my village. Things were going full circle. Showed him the cows, my family, my mom, my siblings, all the nomad life, what to eat, a roasted goat or a camel milk, chai, things like that. For Nathan to have come from all the way from his own planet to our village, rarely do you see people of color like him. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, but when he, when he did what I saw, the young kids were fleeing away from him because they have never come across that. Then I could see myself in their eyes when they were running away. As we spent time with the villagers and the elders, showing Nathan where they get water, how they get their food, the elders were of the view that since Nathan has come all the way to our village, he should be adapted into a Pokot young warrior so that he can defend the village and join the troops of the local people. And when he did, the villagers came up with an elaborate way of 
turning a young man into a warrior or manhood. They call that rite of passage sapana. So sapana is a traditional thing that happens to all young men when they become warriors in the community. And it was described to me as being painted green. Now, I thought that it would be literally painted. Um, but what happened was I was brought a goat and handed a spear and told to kill the goat. Now, being from the suburbs, this was not exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, but hand over hand, I killed the goat. The goat was cut open, uh, pulled out its intestines. Green feces was then extracted from the goat's stomach, and I was covered in green feces. Luckily, we have the video to prove that it happened. <laughs> now, after this, the elders charged us with a task. They said, we want you to help us start a school for kids. So we went to all the warring communities in the desert and asked if we could have their orphans. The idea was that if we could bring together all the kids from the warring communities, that they would study together and learn together and play together the way Michael and I had, and that they would become friends. And this friendship would then become the foundation for peace in the desert. And the crazy thing is, it started to work. We are telling this story because from a hindsight, we can't believe that Nathan and I have deployed our friendship into touching 400 children and counting who are at our school. And these kids are growing, they are in a safe heaven, and they have had also an exceptional opportunity to attend school. Like we say with Nathan, a new, a whole new tribe is in the making. The 21st century presents us with some big challenges in our globalized schools, neighborhoods, and villages. And if we're going to address these challenges, we're going to need to bring together cross-cultural teams from different backgrounds, perspectives, and specializations. And friendship is a powerful tool. Chances are there's someone that you know that you need to learn their big and small story. Start a friendship. And who knows? You just might change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.